Good morning and welcome to an actual news update. I'm doing an update on the Pennsylvania Schools uh, Empl Employees Retirement System, or PSERS. Um, as I mentioned back in April, there is an investigation going on uh, with regards to a calculation of a nine-year average return on their assets for the fund. Um, so you can see Pennsylvania's biggest pension racks up costs after misreporting returns. So I have some updates from the news uh, over the last month and a half or so. What has happened, of course, there are ongoing FBI investigations. I'm here using the tag piecers, so that's how you'll find all of these stories on the um, pension fund, this pension fund. So they've been investigating themselves. This is from early in May that they have spent more than a million dollars so far to investigate. And I want to scroll down to one particular paragraph because I want to focus on this. They had said originally that the nine-year average return that they're using for the risk sharing plan was 6.38%, okay? This was two basis points, so a basis point is 0.01%. It's very small, uh, but it made a big difference, kind of. So the target rate, I guess, is 6.36%, so if the average came in above that, uh, nothing had to happen. But if it came below that, then they had to, um, the employees had to contribute more. But they didn't say how much more. So instead of 6.38%, they're now saying it really was 6.34%. So the difference between what they had originally reported and what they say is real is four basis points. Again, it's a small number but it's very important in its consequences. So they said that um, you'd have about 100,000 workers and it will, their contributions will increase. The example given here is someone who makes $45,000 per year gross and they would have to pay, this is total, not additional, $8.65 cents. Uh, as a contribution, and this is 0.75% of their gross salary. So this is less than 1%, by the way. So it evidently was going from 0.25% to 0.75%. So you can say, oh, the contribution tripled. But if you actually calculate this out, um, so if it's a biweekly paycheck, you get 26 of those per year, this would be a couple hundred dollars, okay? And that's, they're already putting in a certain amount. So, no, it's not great if your net goes down, but it doesn't go down by much. Um, so that's the first thing. It's a small difference on the returns. It actually is a small difference in the contributions. Um, so this risk-sharing plan is not as bad as I originally thought because I thought there was going to be a huge difference between what they had to contribute if they were above or below the target. And it's not really a huge difference. You can say, oh, they tripled how much they have to pay and they're barely paying anything in themselves to begin with. And if you want to see what the contribution rates are like, let's jump over to the public plans database. So here is the public plans database page for PCERS of Pennsylvania school employees. So if I go down to this graph. This is the employer's contribution um, graph. The blue bars are what they actually contributed as a percentage of payroll. And you can see in recent years, um, this is almost a third of the payroll. That's the employer. So they're putting in almost 33% and the employees are putting in 0.75%, not even 1%. That's a huge disparity. It's not a big cost saver, this risk sharing plan, but I guess they figure you start somewhere. It does reduce the cost a little bit, but not much. Um, so the amount of money being affected by this is not actually a lot. 
but you can see the consequences are very big. The FBI are investigating this. Um, the board itself is investigating to see where the error is. And in a recent uh, news story, we find there may be an explanation, and it's not criminal, but it is sloppy. So from the actuarial news, I have this link to the Philadelphia Inquirer, and I just want to note that Joseph N. Stefano, uh, excuse me if I mispronounce the name, um, has been the person at the Philadelphia Inquirer who has really been, and Spotlight PA, who's really been investigating this uh, for the newspaper, and his stuff is generally what I'm looking at, though there has been coverage in the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal and other Pennsylvania papers. So evidently he was given some internal documents and this may have come out of the Peacers Board investigation, but it sounds like it was just simple operational error. If you look at this table, and it is cut off because this is the only part portion that was shared in the story uh, for 2010 to 2018. So this is the return um, that was used for the calculation. So that's this column here. I guess it's as of end of first quarter, I mean, 3-31-20. I, I don't have all the details here, and I assume these documents will become public eventually um, uh, in general. So this is what was used for the calculation. Then I see the letters CAFR here, which would be the comprehensive uh, annual financial report. And these are the audited numbers. They are not exactly the same. So for 2010 to, through 2013, you see this is a one basis point difference. And some of them are higher on the CAFR and sometimes it's lower on the CAFR. That you can see when it's one basis point difference, it may just be a rounding error in how they're calculating it. So those I don't consider suspicious. But you see these interim ones here for 2014, 15, 16, and 17, especially 2015. 37 basis point difference is a big difference, as you can see. So I have a feeling of what happened here, especially once we get into the... Um, especially once we get into what the story says. So the documents reveal a fund consultant, Aon, blamed the mistake on its clerical staff for inputting bad data. So this makes me think someone was typing numbers in manually. Now, manual processes have a lot of opportunity for error. And I'm just going to go back to that table and I'm going to point out what we see. 3.5 for 1% and 3.04%. What if someone was typing it by hand and instead of putting 3.41, accidentally they do 3.041? What if that was what happened? Um, it, you know, it will eventually come out. I have seen other operational risk issues like this, but here's the issue. Um, there are no good control processes. This is what Sarbanes-Oxley was put together to fix for publicly traded companies. It was not, I mean, the Government Accounting Standards Board and others put together their own standards, but they're obviously not up to the level of what is required for publicly traded companies, um, even for such a large pension fund is this one. Uh, so, and, and there's various details of consultants hiring consultants, um, being warned not to use the non-audited numbers for various calculations. Um, it sounded like sloppy processes to me. So this is a black eye for governance for piecers. If we go back to the stories in my feed with this tag, You'll see that the teachers union is asking for leadership changes uh, for the board and oversight because obviously there are some operational problems. There's some governance issues here. 
Uh, it was a small difference. It's a four basis point difference, but it's had huge repercussions um, for the fund. And uh, I assume they will get it cleaned up. There will probably be lawsuits galore. The FBI, so the FBI is doing its own investigation, looking to see if there's kickbacks or bribery involved. But looking at these numbers, and this is probably why uh, this document was shared with uh, the reporter at the Philadelphia Inquirer, uh, it looks like it just may be an error and sloppy practices of how they, you know, calculated this return. And you would think something that important, they would have better processes around. I've been in financial reporting myself, and I can't say I'm surprised. Um, I'm sure they're going to tighten up their operations and their management after this. But, you know, the damage is already done. What are you going to do? Finally, I want to talk about, um, I mean, and this is about their assets and their investment return. I do want to talk about their allocation. I've talked about this before. Let's go back to the public plans database. And there's two sets of graphs uh, that I want to point out. So the first one is a pie chart. Um, this shows the allocation as fisc end of fiscal year 2019. So that would have been mid-2019. And what I call core asset classes are publicly traded equities. So that is the blue. And notice that PSERS only has 14% in that versus almost 47% for uh, their peer group, uh, which would probably be other, um, you know, other uh, teachers or school employees, pensions of a certain size. Then we have red. Red is fixed income or bonds. And it could also be mortgages, um, fixed income 23.2. Uh, so again, these are generally what we see as core pension assets and then all of these others. So we have private equity, um, real estate, commodities, and hedge funds would be considered alternatives. And then they, they have, I think, another slice, which is, oh, cash, a hedge fund, and then the yellow is miscellaneous alternative assets. Um, but still, what you see here, so 47 um plus uh, 23, so about 70%, almost three quarters of uh, the assets are in the core, and then, you know, about 20, a little more than 25% in alternatives. That's for uh, the whole universe, but the, um, <laughs> for PCERS, it's over 50% in alternatives. If we look at their trajectory over time, so I believe it's the same colors as in the pie chart, but now they're at line graphs, so we can see how it's changed over time. We see that those publicly traded equities, boom, through the financial crisis, and then, you know, just letting it erode down to such a low allocation while these alternative asset classes go up and fixed income. So that's an interesting asset allocation. This makes for some very challenging calculations, the private equity return. So let me go back to that. So again, from the Philadelphia Inquirer, uh, this FIGS Incorporated is one of the private equity or was one of the private equity investments of PCERS and others. Um, usually you have a small group of investors for private equity. The pension fund was uh, invested in this Figs Incorporated went public. So now their private equity ownership has become shares. Uh, they can sell those shares and that's when they would achieve their return on private equity. That's generally how pension funds um, and other institutional uh, funds like endowments make money off of private equity. When it goes public, you get shares as a part owner and then you sell the shares and you get cash. That's how it works. Okay, but here's the issue. And I, I did a post on this on May 12th, uh, which public pension funds have the highest holdings of alternative assets. 
And I've done this comparison and ranking before. That's why I said 2021 edition. And I looked into it because Pacers has such a high allocation. So I said, you know, um, where does it land in a ranking table? Um, they've been trying to chase yield. They're trying to get those high returns compared to peers or, you know, just compared to anything. I made a table. I'm going to make that bigger. It's still hard to read, I know. But uh, Pacers is right where I have my little, let's see, well, that's not much of a zoom in. But there it is uh, behind Texas County and District, Arizona Public Safety. So unfortunately, as you can see with the Arizona funds, they're basically the same fund. Sorry, same for Maine Local and State and Teacher. They're basically the same fund. These are ranked by their holdings in 2019. So you can see that Peacers is in the top 10. And then I went to look on, okay, is there any relationship between how much alternative assets you have and what return you get? So, yeah, I put labels on all of these. And you can see Peacers right here. So high allocation, and it's just a big cloud. Yeah, it's a little lower. And when we go to the public plan database, you see when they're compared against peer funds, their five-year return and 10-year return is 70 basis points, 80 basis points below um, their peers. And for a five-year or a 10-year, that, that really adds up. That is a big difference. So let's go back to this. This is one of my scatter plots. I do the linear fit. Um, and, and if I remove these outliers like Dallas Police and Fire in the Louisiana, it doesn't make much of a difference. So you can see there's a negative correlation, meaning the higher your allocation to alternatives in 2019, the lower your 10-year average um, uh, return. That's the vertical scale. However, look at the R squared, and that measures kind of how good it fits, how, how strong is this correlation. It's almost zero. Um, this is meaningless. I also did it average versus average, and this is like essentially flat. Yeah, you could say it's negative, but the R squared is very low. Um, there seems to be essentially no correlation whatsoever. Uh, I actually thought it might be a stronger negative correlation because those funds that are doing poorly would go, it, it, the cause and effect goes the other way that because they're doing poorly, that's why they're going into alternative assets. They're trying to make up for the poor returns on your boring core asset classes. So let's juice returns by going into alternatives. So finally, I made this uh, what's called a jitter graph or jitter plot, where uh, each of these dots is uh, a, a pension plan for that fiscal year. So starting in 2001, going up to fiscal year 2020, um, it, you'll see there's not as many dots. That's because we don't have all the data for fiscal year 2020 in the database yet. And all of these data came from the public plans database. I put line graphs on top of this jitter plot so that you can see what the median, the 75th and the 25th percentiles are doing. And you can see since uh, 2001. And you can see some acceleration of increased allocations to alternative asset classes um, since about, uh, you know, the financial crisis uh, in 2009. And I don't even want to know what 2020 and 2021 are going to look like. Uh, but we can see, uh, and you should ignore really these percentiles in the median for 2020, um, because it's a subsample of the full database. Um, in any case, you can see there's this wide variety and they've been increasing in general. There are a few plans that have 0% in alternative asset classes, uh, but it's fewer and fewer as the years go on. So, you know, that's, that is what it is, as it were. Uh, I'm sure we'll be hearing more about Pacers. I, I don't know just what we're seeing right now. There may be no criminal charges that come out of this, but as I said, I'm expecting lawsuits uh, because if Aon was sloppy and other people were sloppy um, 
in governance, and there's probably going to be a whole chain of blame involved. I don't know, you know, I actually don't know what the legal liability is here. I'm not a, I'm not a securities lawyer, um, not a accounting lawyer or anything like that. Um, so it will be interesting to see how this evolves. Um, I do expect there to be more questions over the asset allocation and the governance of these funds. Um, and I know about some of the other stuff that's going on, but because that's not in the news right now, I'm not going to talk about it. It will come up again. Um, these stories, they're very long term. And so I follow these long term. You can follow Actuarial News, so actuarial.news. This is the tag pacers, or you can just do the public pensions category, which will get you more stories than just pacers. Um, so you can take a look at what's in there. Uh, you can tell that I, I just added a bunch of uh, pacers uh, stories, but I have some other things in here too. Um, so enjoy.